Ja, vielleicht starten wir jetzt. Es sind oben noch vielleicht ein paar unterwegs, aber ähm, ja, first of all, welcome Peju Laiwola. Um, you're going to speak today on um, intersection trajectories, women's art in Nigeria. But first of all, I would like to say something on the residency program, because it is now the fourth year that we have been running the curator and residency program here at the Schmäler House in collaboration with the Goethe Institute, as you know. After guests from Egypt, Japan and Brazil, it is wonderful that you are now here from Lagos, Nigeria. So a warm welcome to you, Peju. And we are very happy to have you here as our guest and expert for two months now. So she, she will be staying until December 8th. So you have the opportunity to meet her here in the Schmäler House or to invite her or to talk with her during her stay. And we, all the curators from the Kunstsammlung, have uh, now the opportunity to exchange and share ideas with you regarding our research project Museum Global and to learn more about the complexity and diversity of Nigerian culture and art. That's what is also the reason why you are here. So during my two weeks research trip to Lagos in April this year, which was funded through a grant by the Goethe Institute, We met already in, in, in Lagos and I visited you twice in your Women and Youth Art Foundation where we spoke about your work but also discussed problems on Nigerian modernism and here especially the invisibility of female artists. So a topic I'm especially interested in and I'm still working on and that's also the topic of your talk today. Um, Peju was a big help at the time. When I was in Lagos, she connected me with, with scholars and curators working on these issues and she helped me to get in touch with people who might know where I could find some of these hidden and mostly difficult to access works by these artists. So thank you so much, Peju, for your incredible help and support. Now I'm going to switch in German because for your CV you know it very well. She is, also Dr. Peju Laivola is a professor of art and art history um, an der Universität in Lagos. Sie ist eine Künstlerin, aber sie ist auch Aktivistin. Seit 2011 lehrt sie an der Universität in Lagos Kunst und Kunstgeschichte. Und zuvor war sie aber auch schon Dozentin an der Universität von Ibadan und der Universität von Benin, wo sie seit eigentlich 2000, also 1991 immer wieder sozusagen verschiedene ähm, Dozent, also dozentiert hat und verschiedenen äh, Unterricht gegeben hat. Ihre Arbeiten, also ihre künstlerischen Arbeiten, sind in zahlreichen Einzel- und Gruppenausstellungen in Nigeria, aber auch international ausgestellt worden. Also ich sag, ich nenne nur einige Orte in Wien, in Österreich, Chicago, Philadelphia, Washington in den USA, in Nordirland, aber auch in der Republik auf Irland, wo sie ein Jahr gelebt hat, in Dresden, in Deutschland, in Madrid, Spanien, in Paris, Frankreich und natürlich in ganz verschiedenen Orten äh, in Nigeria, weil sie lehrt in Lagos, lebt aber auch in Ibadan, das ist ungefähr eine Stunde von Lagos entfernt, wo ihr Mann auch Professor an der Universität ist. Ähm, eine Ausstellung ist äh, 2015, da war sie beteiligt, äh, Künstlerische Tatsachen, Boundary Objects im Kunsthaus Dresden. Und da war auch schon eines ihrer wesentlichen Themen, wo sie sich sowohl theoretisch auch, auch künstlerisch mit beschäftigt, nämlich die Auseinandersetzung mit den Benin-Bronzen, worüber sie heute auch sprechen wird, die ähm, in Nigeria von Nigeria geraubt wurden bzw. unrechtmäßig erworben haben. Also ein Thema, was brisanter nicht sein kann, leider, leider so spät erst. Aber in der Diskussion mit dem Humboldt-Forum ist es ja sozusagen jetzt in aller Munde. Und Pedro Laiwole arbeitet seit vielen Jahren schon über diese Thematik, hält sehr viele Vorträge, Workshops, macht Ausstellungen und hat auch ein Buch ausgegeben in einem, einem praktisch eine Gemeinschaftsarbeit was ich gerne auch noch mal gleich rumgeben werde, ähm, mit dem Titel Benin1897.com Art and the Restitution Question, wo es genau eben darum auch geht. Und das ist auch ein gleichnamiges Ausstellungsprojekt gewesen, was an verschiedenen Orten in Nigeria gezeigt wurde. Also ich gebe es gleich noch mal rum. Ähm, sie hat ähm, 
aber auch mehrere äh, Texte geschrieben über die afrikanische Kunstgeschichte, die an verschiedenen Orten publiziert wurden, unter anderem 1977, 1997 in dem Band von Stephanie Newell, äh, Writing African Women, Gender, Popular Culture and Literature in West Africa. Und sie hat auch 2000 in, zweit, in dem 2007 von Barbara Plankensteiner herausgegebenen Buch Benin, Könige und Rituale, höfische Kunst aus Nigeria, einen Text verfasst. Immer wieder kreisen ihre Themen äh, und ihr Engagement auch um feministische Themen. Also ich habe ja gesagt, sie ist auch eine Aktivistin. Sie hat auch in diversen äh, Zeitschriften wie eben N. Paradoxa, International Feminist Art Journal, veröffentlicht. Und sie hat auch international mehrere Preise gewonnen. Ein ganz wesentlicher Teil, und das hat mich schwer beeindruckt, ist ihre 2004 gegründete Foundation, äh, Women and Use Art Foundation, die in, sie in Lagos betreibt und wo ich eben auch während meines Aufenthaltes zweimal war, eine Organisation, wo sie ähm, Frauen und junge Mädchen darin stärkt, äh, mit der visuellen Kunst oder mit der Kunst näher zu bringen und ihr teilweise dadurch auch die Lebensunterhalt zu verdienen. Das heißt, es ist ein Engagement, worüber sie heute auch sprechen wird. Und I give now you the talk. So please come and welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Isabel, for such a warm welcome. Um, I bring you warm greetings from Lagos, Nigeria, a city of well over 21 million people. I would like to start by thanking the Kutsamlong, Not Ryan Westphalen, and the Gothe Institute for this great opportunity of exchanging ideas and views with artists and curators within what I will describe as the right atmosphere and an absolutely inspiring museum and cultural environment here in Dusseldorf. I'm particularly grateful to Isabel Maltz, whose initial visit to Lagos started this all and made my coming possible. To Maria Muller for receiving me at the train station and making my and all the other I'm making my well and the other curators I've had a chance to interact with. I'm thankful to Falk for his warm greetings each time I went past his office at Smiller House. I've had the privilege of being at the first press briefing of the new director, Susan. And on the last Monday, I had the opportunity of seeing Susan and other museum staff in a more relaxed environment at the bowling alley. I have seen a few exhibitions, uh, the exhibition by Christian Megat, and poetry of painful joys by Peter Uka, who is also here, of the Kunst Academy. I would like to specially thank Doris Christoph for taking me all the way to Ghent on an exciting museum journey to see a photographic exhibition, the works of Gerhard Richter and the amazing private collection of the Herbert Foundation. We also found time to buy some Belgian chocolates and enjoy the picturesque view of the city. I'm also grateful to Bernard Luthi and his partner, Erika, for their warmth and making my stay here pleasurable. Indeed, a lot has been happening since I arrived in Germany. I arrived on my very first visit to Düsseldorf on the 12th of October this year. And the very next day, I went off to Berlin to attend a conference organized by the activist group Berlin Postcolonial on the Prussian cultural heritage. This conference focused on the request for objects and human remains acquired by Germans during the colonial period in Africa. I shall return to this somewhere during my talk. In this presentation, I do not attempt to give a general history of women's participation in the visual arts in Nigeria, which has blossomed in the last decade. There has been much more information in public domain about the art of women in Nigeria than ever before. Technology has impacted the arts from the 1990s till date. The ease of sharing images, access to information, and the incredible potential the internet presents have transformed the arts considerably so that what happens in a small village in Nigeria can be seen in a place like Wuppertal and vice versa. My attempt is to present to you a small 
but important segment of history to which I am lucky to be a part of, and which began about the 1960s and continues till now. The subtitle, Intersecting Trajectories, refers to my artistic practice and the connections of my art to that of my mother, Princess Elizabeth Olu, born in 1939 and I in 1967. Being born to two different generations in the same cultural space, our experiences and audiences have been so different in ways that impact our arts. This raises questions of intergenerational connections. I'll present some of the projects I've been involved with. My solo exhibition uh, that Isabel talked about, Benin1897.com, Art and the Restitution Question, which was uh, shown in Lagos and Ibadan in 2010. A public art project uh, titled Who's Centenary, also known as WC, uh, in 2014 in Benin City. And if time permits, I will speak about my advocacy efforts with the Women and Youth Art Foundation, an NGO focused on teaching arts and crafts, which I founded in 2004. Cathy Deepwell, in, 2008, in, a, in a 2008 publication titled Feminist Models Now and the Future, raises a number of questions which I would also like to pose to you. And I quote, It's an art history that includes women artists, part of your consciousness of art and art's history. Or is it alien to it? Do you regard the presence of women artists as an addition or supplement to the development of art? or as central to it. Can you name more than 10 women artists whose works you regard as truly significant in the 20th century? If these names were only American or European, what about the rest of the world? End of quotes. I think it's important to highlight the ultimate goal of this Gothe residency as stated in my letter of invitation. This residency is one that would help in fostering global cultural networks. To sharpen the international focus of the Kun Samlong in acknowledging knowledge, practices, and methodologies of non-European curators, and I dare add artists, I believe this presentation will be a response to that call, shedding light on the works of artists from other cultural backgrounds different from Europe. This is relevant in forging a truly global art history. So we go on a journey to Benin City, Nigeria, a city known for its exquisite art in bronze, ivory, and wood, and where my mother and I were born. Benin City is located in the south of Nigeria and is not to be confused with the Republic of Benin, um, which is to the west of Nigeria, the French-speaking country to the west of Nigeria. Benin was a vast empire ruled by an all-powerful king known as the Oba. Till date, there has been about 39 kings on the throne of the Benin kingdom. The most recent king, Oba Ewai II, was installed last year. Kingship is passed on from father to the first son within a particular family. The king was regarded as a god king. His words were infallible. He established guilds that catered for making art that glorified royalties and documented what transpired in the courts. So these artists were regarded as court historians in a society that was non-literate. So that is a slide showing um, the king of Ovoramen, who was on the throne from 1888 to 1897. That was the king that was, that was uh, exiled to Calabar by the British. Then his son, um, Oba Eweka, took over in 1914 when he died and was on the throne in 1933. Oba Kenza II uh, was on the throne for 45 years and he was succeeded by Oba Redawa. And the king on the throne now is uh, Oba Ewa II, who was installed, who became king just last year. Benin had a lot of interactions with Europeans, such as the Portuguese, Dutch, and British with whom they had trade relations. The Portuguese were the first set of Europeans to arrive in the city in the late 15th century. In 1485, they were surprised to find a vast kingdom made up of several organized villages and cities, which was called the Great City of Benin. 
1674, a Portuguese ship captain, Lorenzo Pinto, observed that where the king resides in Benin is greater and larger than Lisbon. The British were the last set of Europeans to come into the Benin Kingdom, and in their zeal to take control over trade in the region, they fell out with the all-powerful king. Benin was raised down. Thousands of exquisite bronzes were plundered from the palace. About 4,000 looted objects made in bronze were taken to England and auctioned to offset the cost of the expedition. Some of these works were then acquired by several museums in Europe and America. Although Benin was not colonized by the Germans, Felix von Lushan acquired a lot of Benin bronzes for German museums when they came on the international market. And we find samples of uh, works that are in the museums today. These uh, photographs were taken in the Museum of Ethnology in Vienna when they had an uh, exhibition on Benin in uh, 2007. Um, to the extreme end is the pectoral mask worn as a hip mask by the Oba of Benin. And it represents the, uh, the head of the Queen Mother, uh, which is a very, uh, very important title in Benin. Um, this mask was a symbol of uh, a festival that held in Nigeria in 1977. I will come to talking about that much later. And uh, so these are samples of works of Benin art, and I'm sure that you are conversing with the works here because we have quite a number of them here in Germany. Now, you may wonder why I've gone into this very elaborate history of Benin and how I connect to this history. Princess Elizabeth Olu was born to about Kenzwa II, uh, who reigned from 1933 to 1978, and she was, uh, her mother was Queen Eyoba Ederao at Kenzwa. She grew up in the palace and was inspired by the court artists who were constantly involved in making these objects for the shrines. She started off making mud sculptures similar to the tableau of human figures she saw on the altars in the palace. She also assisted her mother, who was also very talented, in designing and making parts of the royal regalia for the king. Olowu taught art for several years in many secondary schools in Benin. In the 1960s, she worked with a blacksmith whose studio was opposite one of the colleges in which she had taught art. He specialized in making small bells used for worship. This was her first encounter with metalworking. She later studied sculpture and bronze casting at the University of Benin in 1976 and was one of the pioneering students of that university. She became the first female bronze caster to work in a medium that was the exclusive preserve of males in Benin society. It was taboo for women to cast in bronze in Benin. Her father, Oba Kenzwa II, gave her royal prerogative. He asked the bronze casters to allow her access into their foundry and to teach her the process, the local process of casting, which was the lost wax or serpedu technique of casting. She recollects, and I quote, My father believed that women should not be limited in any way and should be given a chance to excel. He believed in supporting his children, particularly his daughters, and sent us to the best schools in Nigeria. He also gave us lots of landed property um, so that we may be comfortable and have some level of economic power when we grow up. And she also speaks about how conducive it was for her as a young girl to grow up in the palace of the king. So the next slide is a short video, a clip of my mother. This was when we had a performance in Benin. So um, she was in charge of dressing up the performers. So we interviewed her, and this is what she had to say. I was determined to, to read, or determined to achieve. And then, babe, I moved from the cradle in, in, in the palace. I moved from the cradle to a world of art and art activities. Because the palace is a university of uh, creative art of all sorts, all kinds. Name it. Is it carving? Is it modeling? Everything. The women are involved in their own uh, bidding work and beautifying the, 
the wealth of the Oba at that time, they're not involved in uh, trading, you know, not beautifying the palace, beautifying themselves. And I was participating, you know, I was interested, maybe the, the art, artistic uh, a trait in me was you know, showing, I was showing it, I, I could stay with them, holding, picking beats, and helping them, watching everything they, you know, they were doing. Now, Edo society celebrated women in many ways, yet at the same time exhibited some cultural practices that were oppressive. There were glorious stories of great women in Benin, such as Queen Idia and Eden. Queen Idia was the mother of Oba Esige, who reigned from 1504 to 1550 AD. She played a very significant role in sustaining the throne for her son, when she died, the king instituted the title of Iyoba Esige in her honor. These women in Benin history were deified and highly regarded, and this stands at opposite ends to practices and religious strictures that are adverse to the rights of women. For instance, women were not allowed into the foundry, as it was believed that they would pollute the tools of the trade and cause failure during the casting process which was regarded as sacred. Perhaps in recognition of this ambiguity that Olohu focused on the female form, one particular work alludes to this, um, you know, this whole idea of depicting women and giving them you know, some kind of strength. And this is a cement statuary titled Akada, which he did in 1978. And it speaks of the transformative power of education to the life of a young girl. Some of her works are autobiographical. As a young girl, she was also always seen reading a book and was nick nicknamed Akada, which means bookworm. I remember posing for my mother while she made this sculpture, which is one of the oldest sculptures from the Benin University Art School. Olohu grew up learning about the cultural values of the Edo society. She understood the language and the culture of her people. Over time, her works uh, increasingly became focused on the female form, the woman as mother or the woman as caregiver. The harem where she grew up was completely a female domain. No male was allowed in. It comprised only the wives of the king and the female servants who attended to them as princes and princesses of the palace. In the early 1980s, she, was, she made a series of diminutive sculptures which she titled Mother of Many. Edo society focused on the importance of children as well. Women were recognized in society only when they had children. A woman was greatly honored if she was married. If she had children and was able to live with her husband, she was better recognized. Her sculptures also depicted women in various stages of pregnancy. This is a work she did in both cement and bronze, and she titled it Zero R. And here she talks about the travels that women go through at the point of delivery. And you may better understand this if you live in a country like Nigeria, where you have a high, where you have high infant and maternal mortality rates. So she tries to reflect the belief in the use of herbs and uh, medicinal charms, and uh, you know, so that when a woman is um, is pregnant. She wears these charms to protect her, and uh, you know she's also su supposed to sit down on a very hard surface, so that as she counts down to zero, that's the ninth month, as she counts down to zero, it will be very easy for her to push out the baby. So zero is the you know at the, at the very point at which the baby comes out. So she also has uh, other works like the reclining woman, uh, the woman in love. Then another version of the, the pregnant woman, and of course she has a lot of women uh, holding babies, taking care of uh, children. I grew up with this strong woman, and as a young girl growing up in this art-charged environment, I had only one vision, to become an artist. The art treasures of the great Benin Empire inspired me. I was also inspired by my mother's art. I started off by copying her work. In terms of theme, they were similar. 
if she did a woman in full term of pregnancy, I did one at half term. Stylistically, our works began to look alike, and some of the similarities are discernible from the texture in my work, which is titled Fourth Month and has titled Mother of Many. I also tried to see how I could tweak my work a bit, and I focused a lot on uh, bringing the work to high luster, but she maintained some kind of patina on her work to make it look much older. I also did a few other sculptures, uh, one titled Polygyny, Two women married to one man. Their husband considers them as mere wives and as the same, but they see themselves as different individuals, and because they struggle to gain the man's attention, they're in constant conflict and seem to have fallen out here, so they sit back to back. Another work titled Quest for Water is inspired by uh, one of my mentors who um, incidentally... um, employed me when I started teaching at the University of Benin in 1991, uh, late Professor Irene Wamboje. He had done a series of um, women carrying loads, carrying things on their head, which he titled, they were prints, they were lino prints, and he titled uh, this series of um, prints, um, Romance of the Head Load. So this work was actually inspired by the work that he did. So I was happy to be known as a bronze caster. I was basking in the fame of a mother who had broken tradition. I wanted all my works to be made of bronze. I felt that this was the only path to success. I also incorporated her work into one of my mixed media pieces in a new series of works that are inspired by images titled Nurture and Nature, which was done in 2015. And here I superimposed my photograph with the image of her sculpture to speak about the bond established through filial relationships which extend throughout life, in this case between my mother and I. Then, in 2002, I met Bruce Onobrakwea, the master printmaker and perhaps the most celebrated artist in Nigeria. He invited me to lead workshop sessions in goldsmithing and bronze casting in his famous workshop, established in Delta State. There I learned to explore many other media. I also learned various techniques of printmaking and became more experimental in my work. This was the beginning of a new phase in my career. My works became much freer. I was no longer tied to working only with metal. And I did a series of works. Um, This one was a mixed media work, and I picked things from around the premises of the workshop, Um, you know, um, coconut shells, a uh, lot of uh, vehicle parts, firewood, fuel wood, um, nails from around the compound there, and then I put them together to make this work. Um, the next one uh, is a, there are several prints I made, about 100 prints that year, um, from a technique which he had taught uh, us to do, um, creating reliefs from emery cloth or emery paper, and then printing them out and introducing uh, pastel colors into them. Um, the next one is, um, is a print, but in this case, instead of printing on paper, I took out the impression on metal foil. And the title of this work is Conversations of the Gods, where I put together um, the Greek gods and the pantheon of gods in Yoruba culture. And I felt that if the two uh, cultures converse, there's something really wonderful will come out of this discussion. Now, in the middle of this work is an Ifar board, which is a, a divination uh, board, and I inserted a Greek scene in the middle. I was very concerned about textures. I took out textures from a lot of objects, like uh, washers. I did some chemical etching on metal and, and took the impression with the metal foil. I also worked with quite a variety of colors, Earth colors were very attractive to me. I used um, brown, I used um, yellow ochre, and sometimes even brighter colors. Like in this work, I used a lot of uh, blue and orange for the next. And this work is a six-piece panel, which is uh, presently on display in a gallery in uh, in Nigeria. Uh, Combined two techniques here, where I used the press to uh, create the texture and then also pushed out the metal by directly through the process of reposé. 
So by 2003, I had done enough works to have a solo, a joint show with my mother. And my art was basically no longer defined by medium. And I, although I wasn't making any work that was, uh, I wasn't making any statements in a particular direction, but I was happy doing what I was doing, making things that were pretty, and I was happy to sell what I made. And at that time, that was enough for me. The real break began when I started using the archives to inform my work. It was easy to pick up stories I had heard from Benin. The British expedition to Benin in 1897 was one of such stories. In 2007, I contributed an essay to the catalog of a traveling exhibition titled Benin Kings and Rituals, Court Arts from Nigeria, which held in Vienna. About 300 looted Benin objects loaned from different museums in Europe and America were exhibited in this show. This was the first time of bringing Benin looted objects together in a single exhibition since 1897. The show traveled from Vienna to Berlin and Paris and closed in Chicago. In Chicago, I gave a lecture at the close of the two-year exhibition at the Art Institute of Chicago, the venue of the exhibition. After I returned to Nigeria, I began thinking of a body of works that will engage this issue of contested patrimony from an insider's perspective. I began to think of ways of bringing together my personal history with a communal one. Issues about cultural identity were uppermost on my mind. For example, what does it mean to have the treasures of a country domiciled in another country? And in this case, what does it mean for us to teach Nigerian children about the art and culture from the outside? So in 2010, Benin1897.com emerged. Benin was the venue of the expedition, um, 1897, the date, and .com, like the domain name, means commercial. And it refers to the fact that commerce was the main reason the British sacked Benin. It also refers to the commodification of Benin objects. Objects sold for a few pounds at the close of the 19th century now attract huge prices on the international markets, and all of these transactions are going on without recourse to the true owners of the art forms. Beyond the sale of the physical art forms, a lot of revenue is derived from copyrights, publications, gate takings, licensing, use of images of these looted works in various museums. So some of the works that I did were actually installations, and we find that between three to 4,000 works, I mean, the exact number of works that were plundered is not known. But between three and 4,000 works were looted from the palace. And in this um, work, I tried to create um, a thousand heads, which was more than enough to cover the gallery floor. So if you're looking at 4,000, it was four times the amount of the number of heads that are done. And I didn't do these works in an expensive material like bronze. The works that were looted by the British soldiers were actually made of bronze. So I did this in clay and fired them to high temperature and then covered some of them with um, metal foil, with brass and copper metal foil, and also did some uh, patination on them. Um, we are told that the British soldiers um, took some of the works for themselves. They gave some to the Queen of England and a lot of them were auctioned when they got the works uh, back to the UK. And so this is a work that is a direct reference to the uh, works that were clustered and packed in the courtyard of the king by the British soldiers. And I had shown you a photograph much earlier of the British soldiers sitting in the midst of their loot. Now this is a close-up of um, the same work, which is the title piece of the exhibition, 1897.com. I also had a broken plaque, which was fragmented, uh, talking about the fragmented history and the, the disruption of the political and social systems that the Europeans met in place. Another work titled Theater of War is a way of writing down some of the accounts uh, that were done, that were put into the diaries of the British soldiers themselves. They took records of everything that went on uh, as they made their way into the city of Benin and also when they got to the palace, where they lay siege for about three days. Now, the number of ammunitions that were expended on a single day uh, were also recorded. As they made their way in, they burnt the villages, 
set people ablaze, set uh, the cities ablaze, and you know people fled. And an eyewitness account reports that British soldiers opened fire on Benin defenders who fell like nuts from trees. So that is the context of the removal of the Benin objects that you see in Western museums today. The soldiers were in the palace for three days, and the third day, the palace was set ablaze. A lot of the works were also destroyed. If you look at some of the works in the museum, particularly the iris, you'll find the burn marks still show, showing on them. So uh, in this installation, I tried to introduce oxides to some of the terracotta heads, and that also gave a, ver a variation of color to the entire installation when I put them all out. So this is a reference to that um, fire that, was in, that broke out in the palace um, during the attack. So another work, which was a new form of commemoration, uh, the heads that were taken, the ancestral heads that were taken off the shrines in the palace were actually heads to commemorate uh, the past king. When a king was installed, he would make uh, ancestral heads in honor of his father. So there were so many heads uh, on the shrine. So the, it was very easy for the British to come in and take them in one clean sweep. So in, in this work, I tried to create um, a new form of commemoration. Um, and I had 113 gourds or calabashes in this installation. And each calabash represents a year since the, um, 1897. And remember that this was 2010. So there were 113 gourds uh, which were painted. I tried also to paint uh, designs that were um, that you know were relevant or which uh, were associated with particular kings. For example, this calabash uh, painted over the fabric is the fabric is a, is is a cloth or commemorative fabric that was done by my mother uh, in 1978 when her father passed. So she designed this cloth. So I took the pattern from the cloth and put it on the calabash as a way of commemorating about Akenzo II. From this, we moved to the conference I spoke about earlier, organized by the advocacy group Berlin Postcolonial. Now, in Berlin, a group of Africans came together, Africans who, had, who were from the colonies, the German colonies, former German colonies, and they were asking for the return of human remains and skulls, particularly the Namibians, uh, <laughs> who had succeeded in some sense to get some of the works that uh, are in the Charité in Berlin. But they're still clamoring for the rest of the, the human remains because they believe that the ancestors must be properly buried. It's a different tradition here. When you have the uh, bones or human remains uh, in, kept in, uh, in museums or kept in, um, in you know, some kind of storage here in Europe, African does not believe that he has done what he ought to do with human remains and he feels that those remains should be returned. So a few of them have been returned. Uh, people of uh, Tanzan Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, and Mozambique are also asking. And a more pathetic case is that of the Australian Aborigines who have not just the Euro human remains, but they also have objects spread across several European museums. And that is actually the case for the Benin Bronzes. They had been requested by the Nigerian state in um, 1977. A request was made to the British government for, the, for a loan, the loan of the ivory pectoral mask I showed you, which is in the British Museum. That was a symbol for the Second World Black and African Festival of Arts and Culture, FESTAC. But when, Nigerian, when Nigeria asked for this um, uh, work to be loaned to them, the British government gave impossible um, conditions and said that the work was too fragile to travel to a place where it was actually made or manufactured. In 2000, uh, in the year 2000, Prince Edward Kenzwa, the Enogi of Obazua, and the great grandson of Obavorame, wrote a letter requesting for the works, and this was presented at the British House of Commons. Nothing came out of that, um, you know, request. And several other requests had, been, had you know, been written by government officials to um, parasitals to um, the British Museum and requesting for the works to be returned. Uh, one instance is the director of the Center for Black and African Arts and Civilization in 2007, writing to the British Museum asking for uh, the works that were looted to be returned to Nigeria. 
I'd like to say that other artists have been engaged with this thing before me, before my time. Uh, there were playwrights like Ola Rotimi and Ahmed Yerima who had written plays about the 1897 event. And um, while I was doing my project, there was a Nigerian, a Belgian-based Benin musician, Monday Midnight, uh, who was doing exactly the same, a musical version of 1897. And he shot his video in front of Buckingham Palace. Uh, he connected with me on the internet. I'd never met him before. But when I told him I was coming to Düsseldorf, he told me, once I land here, he's going to come from, um, from Antwerp. And in fact, last week he came with his family, so I met him for the first time. So we've had other artistic productions, like the film titled Invasion 1897, which, is done by, which was done by Emma Swain Lancelot, and a series of cartoons and paintings by artists in Nigeria. So this is a theme that artists continue to revisit. So we move from this very emotional topic to a more celebratory one, uh, which is the Who's Centenary Project. For the Who's Centenary Project, um, this marked the centennial year of the amalgamation of both the southern and northern part of Nigeria under British rule. And the Nigerian government celebrated this event in a grand style. As artists, we questioned the celebration of the centenary, particularly as the amalgamation was carried out for the convenience of the British administration rather than for the good of the people in what later became known as Nigeria. So we took a second look at the date and saw that 1914 was the year of Balvorame, king of Benin, who stood against British imperialism, died. So I conceived of a, pro a public art project that would be carried out in Benin to celebrate the culture, the costumes, the dances, and the art of the Benin people. And the venue we selected was Igun Street, the home and ateliers of the bronze casters of Benin. So I invited 11 other artists, painters, poets, photographers, performance artists, and installation artists to join me on this project. Um, Wura Natasha Ogunji, an African-American performer, had done a lot of performances uh, with other Nigerian artists. And she was born to a Nigerian father uh, and an American mother. Um, she came to Nigeria for the first time in 2011, and I told her about this project, and she was very excited about it. Mm. Ines Val is uh, Portuguese. It was quite interesting. You know, I told you before that Benin was very cosmopolitan. We had um, Portuguese, we had the Dutch also in Benin, and the British as well. So it was interesting that uh, Ines Val uh, was also part of this project. Uh, Andre Sabo, a photographer very well known, Jimoke Verissimo, um, a poet rendered um, a poem titled No Answer as a reference to the letters that have been written between the Benin royal family, the Nigerian government, requesting for the return of Benin objects. Taye Idao was uh, interested in looking at the kofi or the hairstyles of um, Benin women and princesses. And um, she extended this um, idea of depicting these hairstyles and has really done a lot uh, in Nigeria now with this concept. Um, she also took part in this. She painted a number of, um, did a lot, number of paintings and hung them in front of the ateliers of the artist. Elizabeth Olou designed some of the costumes. She also taught the artist some of the praise songs and performed with Ura Natasha Ogunji. Jude Anogui had a video which was shown in the atelier of one of the casters we did not disrupt the um, activities of the casters. We went in for the public art uh, performance without disturbing the... You know, they were doing their own work. They were still casting and doing their modeling. So, but he installed his video in one of the shops, uh, one of the galleries, um, which he titled Emitere, talking about uh, waves moving in, bringing in things to... and also taking a lot of things back. Uh, George Oshodi gave us a photograph of Oba Eredawa the first which we use for a lot of the banners and the posters and the invitation cards. Uh, I initiated the project. Bronze Ephium was not initially part of the project, but he thought that he should be part of it. He actually came on his own to join us because when Obalvarame was um, exiled to Calabar, it was his family that took care of him uh, during those years. So he felt that he should be part of this and share in this uh, collective uh, history and memory. Victor A. Kameno, a painter uh, who also took part in the Venice Biennale, 
um, did an, a site-specific painting. I get to show you that much later in a short video. And then Jalili Atiku, a famed uh, performer, also did a very interesting performance uh, along the streets of uh, Benin. So the first um, photograph is my mother and uh, Wura Natasha Ogunji, who was dressed like a princess. We, the concept was that um, she would be dressed like a princess and in a way welcoming her, we welcomed her back into Nigeria. And this performance was done in the King's Quarters. We then, all the artists walked from the uh, King's Quarters along Kenzua Street, along Airport Road, and then we stopped at some of the sacred sites. We stopped in front of the palace, went to the center of the city, and made our way straight to Igun Street, where the casters reside and where they do their work. And um, Wura was dressed up in the traditional costumes that princesses wear in Benin. And you can see that she's also clad in it with a kofia, which is known as ukuku, and a lot of coral beads. And this was done amidst a lot of singing and dancing. And the next slide shows you um, the costumes being made. It took me about a year to design some of the costumes. We used a lot of crepe paper, and uh, the beads were actually made of paper. All the beads were made of paper. And I'm going to play this short video for you to see. <laughs> Had a nice time celebrating. The next slide um, is uh, Jalili Atiku, who did a performance which he titled about Vorame's Cathedral. Um, he dressed in this very interesting and outlandish costume, uh, which are actually the, co the covering for imported fabrics. They are used for they are like bales for covering fabrics, protecting them from the, from rain. And indeed, he had the back number of those bales on the fabric and he gave it to some of the other performers uh, you know who were with him um, he discarded the Christian um, um, crucifix and all the things associated with Christian worship and picked on objects like the idiophone known as the bird of prophecy and the one of the ancestral heads became the symbol of his church now, he went along the street calling people, inviting people to join in a service that was to hold at 2 o'clock. So he printed copies of his own version of these hymnals. And as he went along, people gathered on the streets. Um, following him, he had a banner of um, Obavorame, and he was chanting. And um, took a space very close to another church. You can see the signpost there. Um, that space is an open field where they have crusades. And when they're not having crusades, the casters also do their metal casting there. So that was where he laid out his, uh, his mat. That is his church, his improvised church. And uh, he had his performers, part of his congregation. So people were looking and watching. So in the middle of that circle is the bronze head. 
and my mother standing there. She was totally, you know, uh, excited about this performance. And for her, this was not a performance, this was reality. She was enjoying the whole thing going on. So um, Jalili's performance was quite interesting because he, he was along the road when we were doing the procession. He was giving uh, these hymnals and invitation cards to people along the streets. And then they followed him all the way down to Igun Street where we had the activation. Jumoke Verissimo performed her a poem, No Answer, again at Igun Street. Uh, behind is the site, the site-specific installation done by uh, Victor Ekameno, who you saw in the video, and then the dancers uh, who were support uh, artists, supporting artists who joined us on the project. Bronze Efiom, I spoke about earlier, had the umbrella, which was a metaphor for nurture. Uh, he hung a lot of photographs of the houses that Obalvorame lived in, in Calabar. So the, the, the umbrella was a form of nurture, it was a symbol for protection. And uh, this was his performance he did uh, outside of the palace of um, the king. So as we moved along, these are part of the performers who were dressed in crepe uh, fabrics, very similar to the costumes that the high chiefs wear. Further down, you can see the uh, performers in front of the, the king's palace uh, at the ring road. Then the performers again to uh, going into Igun Street where the activation took place. Wura Natasha did a performance. After the initial one that was done in the uh, king's uh, quarters with my mother, she came to uh, Igun Street and she had designed a very interesting stylized head of um, the king, which she wore. And then she painted the broom for sweeping uh, the bronze color. And then she was sweeping, taking very swift um, motions in sweeping the streets. And um, she also had a camera on her chest. As people were watching her, she was also filming those who were watching her. And the whole idea of sweeping, she says, was intended to invoke the labor of workers who clean the city streets. It's a task that often seems endless. Endless. Can a city ever be clean? Sweeping is also a way to clear away history or the past. If it becomes a symbolic act that both makes way for the new and cleans the present so that we may properly observe the past. Now that is Victor doing his uh, painting and also the work, the works, the paintings of um, Tayo Idao, and then my installation. Now, the earlier installation I showed you, the 1897.com piece, I took it to Benin. For me, this was very important, returning those sculptures back to Benin. But here, I installed the sculptures along the corridor of the head of the Guild of Bronze Casting at the Goon Street. What was interesting about this installation is that it became much different, much more different from the one that I had before because I had invited the bronze casters to bring out their sculptures and include them in the installation. So for me, this was quite important, having artists who are trained in the academy, working with artists who were traditional, in quotes, who were trained in a different style, you know, collaborating with us. And these works were here for uh, about two days of the activation, so people were coming in to look at them, and there were a lot of discussions going on about the 1897 event. Um, another view of the sculptures, of the installation. And this photograph I like very much because the woman is looking at it. I'm just wondering what she's thinking about. But the child behind her doesn't even know what is happening. She's sleeping. But it is very likely that she's thinking about the history that she has heard. And it's also very likely that this history will be passed on to this daughter. So the next slide shows the photographs of uh, Andrew and Ines. They had used the archives. They went to the uh, archives and saw a photograph that was taken in 1974 of a house in Igun Street. In 2014, during the activation, they also went to Igun Street and took a photograph of the same house. And in fact, they found some people in the house in 1974, who were also present 
uh, at this uh, event. So they took the two photographs together and put them side by side. Some of the works, or some of the costumes that featured in the Who Centenary Project became part of an installation uh, which I had, um, uh, which I exhibited in uh, Kunstas Dresden in 2015, and it also moved to Spain in a traveling exhibition. Uh, this exhibition was organized by a Berlin-based group, Artifact, and the title of the exhibition was Boundary Objects. So I will move from this project to give you a peep into my next project for next year, uh, where I'll be exploring the clothing tradition of the Yoruba people. I think I'll leave Benin for a short period and look at another culture, uh, the culture of my father. Uh, perhaps this will bring some balance to my mixed heritage as an artist, being born to two strong cultures, Yoruba and Benin. So for this uh, project, I'm going to be exploring the dying tradition of um, Yoruba people. There are a lot of symbols, a lot of uh, patterns that have meaning, which I'll be exploring. I'm showing, I showed this photograph in the middle, myself and my husband, uh, wearing the traditional Ashoke cloth, the hand-woven fabric, which is highly prized in Yoruba land. So these are the things that are going to inspire the next project, which will be shown in Lagos uh, next year. So very briefly, uh, look at the Women and Youth Art Foundation, and I put a photograph of Isabel there when she visited. Uh, the whole idea was to create a platform where uh, youth, women, can learn skills, because there's a lot of poverty. And if people can learn skills and make objects that they can sell, then they can actually leave off the productions that they do. So we felt that we should establish this little group. Uh, it was conceived as an informal, a small informal women's group. And over time, it grew to you know, accommodate more people and became really very, very important in the sense that some of our programs have really had a wonderful outreach uh, in Nigeria. For example, we produced the very first set of uh, videos uh, teaching arts and craft in Nigeria. And um, from the time we, uh, from we, we had the NGO uh, founded in 2004 till 2013, we had sold over 300,000 copies and distributed to different schools. So this was a way of uh, getting art into schools and teaching people how to do things uh, rather than depend on government or depend on others. Uh, for the, for you know for survival. Now uh, we worked with a number of um, schools. We worked with a lot of women's groups. We worked with the physically challenged. We did workshops with the physically challenged, the visually impaired, in the school of the blind in Lagos. We taught them how to do macrame. We taught them how to do beadwork, paper mache, adire making, goldsmithing, a broad broad range of arts and crafts, and. Uh, because the videos are really very successful, uh, we thought that uh, if we did them, we could also raise money for our projects. But after we put them out in the market, after about seven years, the pirates came in and took over the, the market. So we now have to think about other ways of raising funds for our projects, our public projects. Our first major break came in 2012. We hosted the Hillary Clinton Smart Power Project, which was a cultural diplomacy program. About 900 artists applied for this prestigious grant across the United States, and 15 were selected to travel to different parts of the globe to carry out projects using the visual arts as a platform for cultural exchange. So a California-based artist, Brett Cook, opted to come to Nigeria, and in partnership with the Bronx Museum of the Fine Arts in New York, we organized his project. He worked with students of a college in Ibadan and the University of Lagos, and they did a very, very lovely work, which is the most iconic mural at the University of Lagos. Currently, we're working, we're doing a, lot of, a number of workshops with um, public schools in Surulere, Lagos. We realize that um, a lot of public schools do not have art teachers, so students who attend those schools have no um, uh, contact with art. And so we um, volunteer, we get people who volunteer to teach skills to this uh, group of uh, students. And very recently, we had a small grant from the U.S. consulate to continue this project for another year. So i just show you a few of the photographs. These are students of the School of the Blind and students of the um, 
dental school in at the University of Lagos who were learning how to do beadwork. The next slide shows us um, women who are doing um, goldsmithing using the local technique. We try to bring in arts and crafts that are going extinct and we teach women how to do this so that they can actually produce things for themselves. Uh, there does this uh, school project that we are doing currently uh, with about 16 secondary schools in Surulere. And the children are proudly showing the items that they've made. And the other slide here shows the mural that was done um, by the artist, the American artist, African-American artist, Brett Cook. So some of my publications that look at the question of cultural memory of a people uh, whose development had been brutally interrupted and their cultural objects seized by you know, foreign invaders. Uh, my works mainly on Benin looks at memory. Clothing and fashion, I'm returning to that next year. Some of the publications I've done that look at lace culture and the art of dressing well in Nigeria. And I tell you that Nigerians love to dress well. And my work on women artists, my publications on women artists, and some of the publications that have featured my mother's work and also my own work. And I'm going to stop with the last clip. But before I conclude, I'd like to say that uh, in the next few weeks, uh, I, will, I would love to meet with a lot of artists and curators. Yes, I'm meeting with curators at the Kun Samlong. But I've met a very good friend of mine who's here now uh, from South, from South Korea, Jun Suk. She's here. I would, I would really love to meet artists and do some artist visits. And I'm very interested in printmaking. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to go to the Kunst, uh, Kunst Academy uh, to see some of the works of the students and also see meet with the faculty. And I know I'm in very good hands. So this is the very last um, uh, video clip I'm going to show. And it tells about my mother's joy that, that, I've, that I've continued in this tradition of art making. And um, I just want you to listen to her speak. And, and it's, it's doing much more than myself. And it's, it's a great pleasure that, as the, the Bini Adib said, almost so my woman, when your child knows much more than you now, but uh, she got uh, the foundation from me. It's, it's great joy to, to, the, to the parents. When your child is more developed, your child did not destroy what uh, you taught uh, her, uh, even in the secondary school. She's even improving on it, and, and uh, she's, she's doing much more than I uh, uh, can do for that. Thank you very much. Thank you for the highly interesting insight in your work and your talk. So I think there are many questions. So are there some questions? It's Fragen. Ah. Can you explain us what your mother said in the end? Because it was not so good to understand. Maybe because now I'm really curious to know that. <laughs> okay. she, she mentioned that um, it's, it's such a great pleasure to her that I've continued in the tradition of art making. And that the Benin proverb says that uh, it, is, it is the wish of every parent to have a child that is greater than him or her. And that for her, this is a dream come true that she learned the, the art from her mother, and I learned from my mother, and I've continued in this tradition. I've not just done art, but I've done it in such a way that I've even surpassed her. Pedro, when your mother is a princess, are you a princess too? Yes, yes. I'm a princess, yes. <laughs> wow. But I tell people, well, this is just a joke, that my father is a commoner, but her father is a king, yes. Automatically, I'm a princess, yeah. Can I ask uh, oh, yes, one definitely. more question? Uh, I mean, we have seen now a lot of art activities happening in the street or happening with that uh, youth uh, center. Does, in any sense, a museum comes into play with that all these art activities, or is it more 
on site and outside the the museum and uh, on the street and in in society would you say can you tell a little bit about well the, if the museums are needed in in Nigeria of or if they are playing any role for artists well um in my own work, I would say that the museums are doing very well. Uh, we've had a lot of collaboration with the National Museum in Lagos. Uh, in fact, we did, did the earlier workshops that we did were actually done in the museum. Uh, the museum organizes educational programs for children. Uh, we collaborate from the outside. This uh, is a, it's an NGO. It's um, a separate group. It doesn't uh, work with. It doesn't have the government structure. That's why it's called an NGO. Uh, so we do projects uh, collaborating with the museums. The museums also have programs where they have students from different secondary schools visit them and see the collections that they have. So the museums are very involved in this kind of educational programs, yeah. I have a question about your students, your female students. Do you see there is like through the the internet and social social media and everything, Do they have a different approach or do they, are they still interested as you are in the tradition and the history of your country and the culture? Well, I would say that the, the way I've gone is because of the strong influence of my mother. The younger artists are doing different things in Lagos today. Some are inspired by what's happening in society. Some are doing very political stuff. But a lot of them are doing installations, uh, not necessarily connecting directly to the culture. Um, but I know that in this very global um, context that we have today, we have people um, sharing ideas from other artists from different parts of the world. And it's so difficult now to even say that this is a work done by an artist who grew, who's based in Nigeria. Uh, a work done by um, a young artist might not necessarily reflect what is going on in terms of the culture. Um, they have their influence from different places from here and there. So it's very mixed. It's a very mixed um, um, very mixed uh, uh, themes, very mixed genre, mixed techniques that artists are exploring today. But a good number of them are doing things that connect with the culture here. Yeah. And uh, one more. Uh, who's that? You want Anders? Okay, one more additional question to that. And do you see a difference now with the female women in uh, like the students you have, the way they approach art and their life? Is it very different like from your generation and from your mother's? You mean the younger ones? If yeah, the women, the, way the they female approach students, life, yeah, yes, the artists. Female, yeah, uh, you know, there are a lot of, like I said, there are a lot of influences from here and there. Uh, you know that uh, America is such a strong influence on the young artists today and the young minds. So every young artist wants to aspire uh, to do the kind of works that uh, connect to international circuits. Um, if you do a work that is very political, you might not really go very far with it in the sense of uh, not getting people really very interested in the kind of work that you do. But I think that the artists are thinking about bringing out very strong messages in their work. It, is, it used to be very popular for artists to Uh, do works that are very beautiful, that look pretty on the wall, that match the colors on the wall and all of that. But people are beginning to think about works that have very strong content. And I think that's the direction of Nigerian art today. Yeah. Are there other questions? If not, we can continue upstairs with a glass of wine or beer. <laughs> <laughs> is there a need for you to have this performance again somehow well I would say that because it was a centenary commemoration it had to be done in 2014 but interestingly um, when I went back to Benin uh, to the same space where we had the activation The artists were very excited to see me. They were asking if I'd come again for another performance because they were very involved in it. And I think that it's something that they enjoyed doing. They had not been recognized the way uh, we recognized them, the way people came in uh, from different parts of uh, the city to that space where we're having the show. And because of the variety of uh, artistic uh, production that went on and the fact that we had artists from all over, attend um, artists that were of great renown come to that space and uh, made them feel that they were really doing something great. These are the artists who have done uh, Benin proud. These are the artists who have brought Benin to the world map. 
They're the same artists who have done the bronze works that you find in the museums today. And having that activation there was a way of telling them thank you for all that they've done. Um, it's the same generation, the same um, lineage, uh, because the art of casting is passed on from father to son within a lineage. So it's the same, they, they are the descendants of those who did the works that you find in the museum today. So they still practice. And the fact that they're still practicing the arts uh, using the old techniques of Siri Perdue, they don't have the kind of modern furnaces and uh, you know, um, in, that you have here in the West. It's a very tedious process of casting. And they, they could be doing something else which is less difficult and making more money. But because it's a traditional thing and they want to continue the art of their fathers and keep the tradition going, they still um, live along that street and they still do the art that they do. So they were very excited about us coming and they loved the project. If I have the chance, it would be nice to do it again. But I'll tell you that it was a very expensive project uh, to take um, you know, the 12 artists, 11 artists to Benin and all the other supporting artists to design the costumes over a period of one year. It was expensive. And we do not have the kind of um, support from governments that we will expect. But my university, University of Lagos, funded this project in parts. That was why it could even happen in the first place. So if I get the kind of support that I got, I will do it again, definitely. But it will not be the centenary project. It may be something else. But we enjoyed it. It's one project that I truly, truly enjoyed. It lasted for just two days, but it was really wonderful for me. And I'm sure you liked the clips that you saw. Yeah. Oh, OK, Peter. Uh, my question is about the casters, okay. the, the bronze casters. Is there like a proper documentation of the lineage of the casters? Yes, uh, you need to look at, um, yeah, there, there, are, there are publications on the lineage of casters. In fact, my PhD thesis was based on a particular uh, group of casters uh, comprising about nine brothers. They do not belong to this um, established guild. Uh, it's a different family entirely, but they're very well known. They're known as the Oloton Casters. And I focused on that. So that was my PhD dissertation. And um, it was a lot that I discovered. Um, there's a lot written again about the Igun Casters. And in fact, there are a lot of documentaries about the processes of production, how they go about doing their art. It used to be an art that was uh, sacred and hemmed in by secrecy, but now the artists are more open to showing what they do. And um, it's, it's an ongoing process to document uh, artists in Nigeria. And I'm sure that you know that there's still a lot that we need to do in, in writing about artists, yeah. Thank you. Go upstairs, yeah. <laughs> Thank you Sorry, very much. Yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs>